Hey guys, it's International Master Alex Astane, and I'm bringing you today a new series on one of the most important topics in chess, and that is calculation. The series aims to uh, cover a lot of sort of foundational ground um, that many, many players who maybe they don't have uh, such a strong, let's say, uh, classical uh, chess training, they, may, they might actually not be aware of some of the concepts and techniques that are used by master level players who perhaps they had a coach as they were growing up or they went to a chess academy or things like that. Um, this course uh, is actually going to be uh, for YouTube. And so it's not directed at advanced students. It's going to be directed at um, club level students, primarily uh, hobby, hobby students of the game. But at the same time, perhaps there's something in there for more advanced players as well, perhaps some technique that you were not aware of. So hopefully it's suitable for a broad range of levels. Uh, before we dive into the chess itself, I just want to say that calculation uh, understandably has been one of the most requested topics since the launch of the channel about six months ago. So if you uh, do like this particular content, if you do like this first video in the series, um, you know, a thumbs up, a subscription to the channel, of course, and uh, just general comments as well are very, very helpful for allowing us to gauge uh, whether or not we're uh, delivering the kind of content that um, the people want and the people like. Before we uh, dive into the chessboard, I just want to um, talk about a little bit some of the concepts and topics that might be uh, mentioned in this series. We're going to begin in this uh, first video with the scanning method, but then afterwards we're also going to talk about other shortcuts and techniques of calculation, general rules such as the fact that we usually look for checks first before we look for captures, and, um, and also certain calculation uh, techniques that might be applicable only to one phase of the game, such as the end game. So um, it will be a multi-part series, and, and I, I hope that you uh, very much uh, enjoy this, uh, this series. Uh, one final thing that I want to say is that it will be a little bit more interactive than previous series. I will actually uh, give a little bit of homework afterwards. Um, at the very end of the video, there will be some couple of examples which... Uh, people can give a shot at solving if you want, and the solutions will be provided in a shorter um, shorter video that will accompany this, uh, this series. So that'll be done for all of the videos. So if you want to follow along actively in this way, feel free to do so. Otherwise, if you just want to watch the videos without that, that's also, um, that's also very, much, uh, very much okay. So hopefully either way, you will follow along and enjoy. Let's, um, let's now dive in and, and take a look at the chessboard. Um, okay, so the the first thing that we have to think about before we can even really start calculating is what moves should we consider, right? So uh, there's no point in, for example, uh, spending all the time in the world uh, calculating, let's say, this particular sequence here of the knight, which apart from being a rather silly sequence, a uh, three-move sequence to get the knight to a square that is not very good, um, it doesn't take into account what our other options might be. We can't, we shouldn't spend time on that before we figure out what is, what might be worthwhile. And so moves that might be worthwhile, that seem logical to us based on our chess understanding, they're known as candidate moves, uh, which is hopefully a self-explanatory term. They are sort of the, the strongest candidates that we can find. Um, now, in this position here, uh, let's see how we can apply the scanning method. So. The scanning method, I should say, it's quite slow. Uh, it cannot be applied in all situations, but it might be something that you can do in certain positions when you have plenty of time on the clock and also when you're analyzing your games. The way the scanning method works is literally you take all of the pieces. You can start on one side of the board. So let's say you wanted to start on the left side of the board. So you would start on the A1 square and then you move towards the H1 square. And uh, what you do is you try to identify all the reasonable looking moves for all of the pieces. Uh, starting with the rook here, we have moves like rook b1, c1, d1, and e1. And uh, out of all of these, we can consider that perhaps the moves that make the most sense are moves like rook d1 getting onto this open file, or rook e1 also uh, getting onto a semi open, onto a semi open file. Uh, on the other hand, you might argue that a move like rook b1 is also reasonable 
if uh, you want to push this pawn in the future. So we might say that white uh, with this rook, we've scanned, we've quickly scanned what are the options with that piece. And we've come to the conclusion there's two or three squares that we might want to sort of leave there, make a note of it, and return to those moves uh, later on. If we do the same for this rook, uh, certainly we can see the E and the D files are once again the most attractive. The C and the B files are hard to believe, um, but maybe depending again, if I look at this position based on my understanding of chess, I pretty much immediately am discarding C1 and B1, but some other players, uh, depending on their understanding, they might actually say C1 and B1 are worthwhile, right? So the scanning method is a little bit subjective as well in terms of you know what moves you instantly rule out uh, versus not. And, uh, and of course, rook g1 and rook h1, I would say rook g1 is not very attractive, but rook h1, I take note of the fact that this is an open h-file. Then I move on to the next piece, this knight, and I see that e4 is not available uh, as a square. That's, that's blocked here. Uh, g4 is also not available. h3 is not available. d3 would blunder my piece. And so we're going to go ahead and remove all these squares. h1 is, is an option, and d1 is an option. From h1, I see that really this seems about as silly a move as I can construct, uh, knight h1. So I'm probably going to go ahead and rule that move out very quickly. Knight d1, I might consider if I want to reroute that knight to e3, which is actually quite a good square. So um, now we've covered all of the pieces except the king. And for the king, we can say king h2 or king g2. Probably the only move that makes real sense there is king g2 uh, to... Uh, tuck the king away from the h file and also protect that knight on f2. It's a much better square than h2. I see no real advantages to h2. So now what I've done basically with this method is I've scanned all my pieces and I've very quickly tried to discern what are reasonable looking moves. And roughly my, um, my shortlist, my shortlist amongst this sort of shortlist of the pieces is uh, rook d1 to contest the d file, rook e1 to contest the semi-open file, king g2 to tuck away the king, and rook fe1 and rook fd1 with similar ideas, as well as rook h1 and knight d1. So I've got you know six or seven moves or so in terms of uh, what I think are not completely crazy. And that's the, sh that's the list that I'm going to uh, work with in terms of piece, piece uh, candidate moves. Uh, and that's sort of as big as the list will, will get with only one addition, and that addition is uh, pawns. So if we look at the pawn situation, uh, we have to do the same. In this case, I can look at pawn pushes with the A pawn, pawn pushes with the B pawn, pawn pushes with the F pawn, or pawn pushes with the G pawn. There are no pawn captures uh, right now. Uh, I very quickly, in my mind, I'm ruling out these moves. They're not very useful. Uh, same for b3 and b4. Perhaps I would add b3 since it protects the c4 pawn, but I don't consider it very urgent. Certainly I would discard b4 because uh, after capturing here, black can just grab a pawn. Uh, so I'm at most I have b3. And then if I look at the uh, pawns on the king side, f4 is not very attractive to me because I allow black to create a passed pawn or to check me or to grab a pawn. So I'm immediately uh, ruling that out. So in addition to b3, I do, however, see the move g4. And that's the one, the pawn move that attracts me the most. Because, uh, for example, if I play g4 and white black responds with f4, now suddenly I might have a square like this. So if I see these little short lines which are useful to me, I'm going to go ahead and play these moves. Uh, now, once I have my list of like eight or nine moves, I'll quickly try to trim it down further by using you know, my understanding of chess. In this case, for example, my understanding of uh, open and semi-open files tells me that this file here is uh, very, very important. And my intu intuition guides me towards the candidate move, selecting, you know, more favorably, putting it higher up in the ranking, the move rook AD1, um, or alternatively rook FD1. And uh, when it comes to pawn moves, I also am ranking this move G4 uh, quite highly, simply because my understanding of the pawn structures shows to me that uh, black has these two pawns on dark squares. And my understanding of the piece play, this knight here, I may want to drive it to a beautiful central square, e4. So this is uh, a way for me to fight for a potential outpost. So 
I'm interweaving my general understanding of different things like outposts, minor piece play, um, open files. In incidentally, uh, minor little plug, but uh, there's a positional chess series that I made for Chess Factor on ChessFactor.com, and uh, and that's that's uh, covering all of these uh, separate issues. Of course, there is no clear separation between things like candidate moves and uh, and your general understanding, right, and calculation and decision making in general. So uh, that is the first example. Let's go ahead and take a look how you might apply the scanning method in a second example. Okay, so here we are. And once again, if we think of the scanning method, what's a common mistake that some students might make? Well, uh, they're going to go ahead and they're just going to look at this position and just randomly play whatever move comes to mind. And oftentimes that can be best. If you're really low on time, the best thing to do might just be whatever pops into your mind, just play it. As Magnus Carlsen said before, 99 times out of 100, the first move that pops into my mind is actually the best move. Uh, the problem with this approach, of course, is sometimes you're going to miss something. Uh, so again, going back to the topic at hand, which is candidate, uh, sorry, which is the scanning method in identifying candidate moves, we can see here um, that if we use that method, we're far less likely to uh, miss a good move. Uh, so, for, for example, in, in this position here, if I were to just glance at the board immediately, I would probably say my first impressions, at least, were uh, rook takes rook here as maybe the best move. And after rook takes, just go rook d8. And my idea behind all of this, if somebody asked me to explain it, is, well, I noticed very quickly pawns were equal, but my pawn structure is a lot better than white's. And I know that in endgames, when I have a better pawn structure, I usually want to reduce material. So I'm offering a bunch of exchanges. Uh, the problem is that in this position, white has one way of preventing the exchange of these two rooks, and that is the move rook d4. And after this move, it turns out that um, black really doesn't want to capture because white plays e takes d4 and corrects his pawn structure. And here black is still better because uh, he's only fixed these double pawns. These are still uh, bad, and this pawn on g5 in particular is quite weak. But nevertheless, we've lost some of our advantage. So let's return to the scanning method and see what we might have missed, a less obvious move that we might have missed. So if we build out our uh, list of moves, and we start, let's say, with this rook here, uh, we can see very quickly that moves like rook h7, rook g8, uh, rook f8, rook e8, they don't make a whole lot of sense. They're very passive placement of the rook. Um, the only one that might make some sense is to move rook f8 here, just to defend this pawn that is not uh, currently defended. But it seems a little premature to worry about this pawn when it isn't even being attacked yet. And when, you know, our opponent has so many weaknesses that we really want to try and punish them and attack them rather than go passive with a move like rook f8. So, um, again, depending on where you're at in your chess understanding, you may include moves like rook f8 or you may quickly discard them. This is the subjective element. But uh, nevertheless, the scanning method at least alerts you to these possibilities. We've now scanned this rook and maybe at most we've added one or two uh, moves to our list of candidate moves. Let's continue building the list. Uh, this rook here on d8. And we can see... Okay, for sure rook takes d1 is an option, but using the scanning method, we suddenly identify this move rook d5, um, which is easier to forego. And we're immediately very interested because we attack the e5 pawn uh, with it. So that's nice when it carries a big threat. And of course, we also identify the possibility of rook d7. Uh, we're not done yet with the scanning method. We can also use it for the queen and we can identify some interesting squares like e6 and c4 while discarding some more passive squares like b7 and a8. And when we're done with the queen, we'll take a look at the king as well. And we can consider the moves king b7 and king uh, b8. Interestingly, in the same way that the move rook d5 is actually stronger than rook takes d1, we're going to take a look at that in a second in more detail, we actually uh, can see how not only did we identify a move like this by the scanning method, but also, for me at least, the most human move is to put the king on b7. 
But actually, upon close inspection, we won't dive into the nitty gritty of the position. But if you don't trust me, nowadays, there's computers in chess everywhere. So you can check it out by yourself. Without diving into the nitty gritty, the king uh, being placed on b8 is actually a little bit better of a move. And it's a move that you might have skipped if not for uh, using this sort of rather exhaustive uh, scanning method. So uh, why is the move rook d5 a better move in this position uh, than rook d1? It's because it carries a threat and white does not have a move like rook d4. In this case, we would simply take the pawn. Uh, so that possibility is, is no longer there. While if white captures, then queen takes d5, we're seeing immediate pressure on this pawn on e5, and it's not easy to solve that problem. Uh, on the other hand, if white tries to defend the pawn with a move like queen e4, for those tacticians out there, uh, I think that you guys will already be, be knowing what, uh, what the problem is here. Otherwise, test yourselves if you'd like. Uh, but the point, I'll reveal it now, is the move rook takes d1 check, suddenly the queen is lost and with it the game. So this example, I really like it because it shows, you know, a move that is quite easy to understand why it's very strong. But at least for me, when I first saw this position without checking it with a computer, I missed this idea. I would have told you that rook takes rook was the best way to go. But if I was more diligent in applying the scanning method, if I had enough time to do so, then it would be a very, uh, very um, easy move to find. So we're nearly there. Uh, I'm going to show you one final example before giving you a couple more for homework. So let's run through the third and final example. All right, so here we are. And this one is a little bit more of a complicated example, I think, because there's a lot of pieces on the board. Only one minor piece has been exchanged for each side. Only one pawn has been exchanged. So obviously, it's going to be a lot slower to apply this method than if you have a more simplified uh, position with less material. Nevertheless, let's dive in. Uh, in this case, we can start scanning the board from the left again. Uh, and this rook here on a1, we can see white has a move rook b1. Personally, I would quite quickly discard that move. It doesn't really help our position. Uh, but if you wanted to include it when you're using the scanning technique and add it into your shortlist, at least you've identified the move. So here, for example, maybe you add it because you think b4 is uh, a worthwhile plan. So uh, that's the rook. Let's take a look at this bishop. It cannot move, so <laughs> that's good. It's quite simple. It's just paralyzed. Now let's take a look at this knight. Well, knight b3 is an interesting move. Knight c4 is certainly an interesting move. Knight f3 is an interesting move because they all upgrade the knight, so to speak, right? Uh, probably the move that would attract me the most is either knight c4 or knight b3, uh, just because knight b3 hits this bishop, which might be nice. And knight c4 is a fourth rank knight that sort of influences a lot of key squares uh, further up the board. So that's kind of an aggressive move uh, that I find interesting. So the knight, we've certainly built a short list there of at minimum two moves and maximum three moves. And now we move on to the queen. And in this case, well, we can certainly rule out moves like these because we're going to lose our queen also like these, uh, also here. And we can probably rule out moves like queen d1 and queen e1 very quickly because it's like going backwards. We probably went from d1 to e2 not so long ago, and now we're going back to d1. That doesn't make sense. Um, so we're probably ruling those out pretty quickly. Uh, and what else can we say? Well, what does that leave us with? Maybe we have moves like queen d3, queen c4, queen f3. And we might consider that one of those three moves is actually valuable. In my case, I don't like any of them. And one of the reasons I don't like them is because I very quickly spot the knight here will strike at the three. Another reason I don't like them is because from a general principles perspective in chess, you don't want to move your piece to your queen too many times in the opening and certainly not while you still uh, have incomplete development. But that is going back again to the deeply intertwined topic of chess, you know, understanding. Um, uh, let's take a look at the remaining pieces over here. The rook, very interesting, rook e1 and rook d1. I think those are very interesting moves for sure. And the uh, king. King can go to either h2 or king to h1. Certainly I would add those to my list. 
And finally, the bishop. The bishop can go to f3 or to h1. These moves do not attract me so much because the bishop on h1 is worse than on g2. And I would also argue that on f3 it's worse. So I'm not too interested in any bishop moves. I would definitely consider rook moves. Um, not interested in queen moves, not interested in bishop moves. I would definitely consider knight c4 and knight b3, and I'm not interested in moving the a1 rook. So roughly these are my moves as well as, of course, uh, king h2 or king h1. So now I have a list of at most six or seven uh, moves. That's my candidate list. It's been built, and um, from there on, I now have the foundation where I can actually start to um, calculate a little bit more thoroughly. Now, one thing that I want to say before I give you the exercise examples is some stronger players might say, wait a second, chess is not as linear as this. You can't just build uh, a candidate list and do this at every move. You're going to get completely exhausted. And I actually agree. This is impractical advice if you're now going to try to apply it in a three-minute game or something like that. You will be too slow uh, in doing so. However, in certain situations, when you have a lot of time in a position, when the moment is a critical moment, or when you simply want to improve, consciously improve your assessment of a position and your assessment of all the options, the idea is not that you're going to be applying this particular technique at every turn, but that this technique will help you to become a better analyst of chess, a more comprehensive analyst of chess, and that eventually that's going to filter filter through and uh, you're going to reap, re reap rewards even in games which are so fast where you can't actually you know, consciously apply such a slow process. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, and let's, uh, let's show you some uh, potential uh, exercises that you can do if you would like. So let's go into that now. Okay, I'm going to throw you guys into the deep end. This is again an opening position. And what I want you to do is just write down your list of, uh, of moves that you would include into your scan. And if you wish, also you can leave it in the comments below on YouTube. First of all, you can put all your list, uh, the moves that you scanned, and then show me on the second line what moves you actually sort of, when you whittled down that list a little bit further based on your understanding of the game, what did you actually uh, leave there. And if you want, as a third bonus uh, line, I'd also be quite curious to see what is your move that you actually would uh, select in the game. So um, that's the first exercise. And then now I'll show you the second exercise. So uh, here we have a, a, a little bit of an interesting one, since in this case, there is some tension uh, between the, uh, the white pieces over here. And um, so that changes the position a little bit, makes it a little bit more concrete and tactical. But same concept, I've used the scanning technique to identify what are the uh, candidate moves and build out that list, then narrow it down a little bit based on your understanding of the game. And uh, if, you, uh, if you wish to take part, you can leave, uh, leave your answer in the comments below. So hope you've enjoyed this first video on calculation. Uh, if you weren't familiar with the scanning method, then I hope it proves useful to you. And um, I shall see you uh, in the next part of the series soon, at least uh, I hope.